Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Michael Guidi. I'm a family medicine practitioner based in northern Massachusetts. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts Medical Society. If you live in Massachusetts, you'll have heard of the opioid epidemic. This is an epidemic that's affecting people of all races, backgrounds, and ages. You may know people who have become addicted to opioids or died from opioid overdoses. You may have seen children lose their parents, adults lose their futures. The causes of drug use are complicated, but we know that over the last couple of decades, doctors prescribed more opioid medications for treating pain. Between 2010 and 2016, even though the total number of pain cases did not increase, the number of opiate prescriptions quadrupled. More people became addicted to those medications and more people died from opioid overdoses. Some people who became addicted to medications ended up buying other forms of opioids illegally, such as heroin or fentanyl, a powerful drug that's driving up overdose and death rates. It's no surprise then that patients are asking questions like, if I'm in pain, does it make sense for me to use an opioid medication? How can I do that safely without risking addiction? How would I even know if my medicine is an opioid? What other non-addictive pain treatments might work for me? How can I get the medication that can reverse an accidental overdose? How would I use that medication? In this episode of Physician Focus, we have two experts answering these questions and more. One is Dr. Daniel Carr, a professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. After many years of clinical practice, working with patients to address their pain, Dr. Carr now directs a postgraduate program that's entirely about pain and how to manage it. Our other guest is a pharmacist. Karen Horbowitz is the manager of clinical pharmacy services at Inman Pharmacy in Cambridge. When patients go to fill their pain medicine prescriptions, Dr. Horbowitz is the person they speak to. She's involved in opioid research, and she's a past president of the Massachusetts Pharmacists Association. Let's see how they answer your questions. Dr. Carr and Karen Horbowitz, thank you for joining us today to talk about a uh, very important topic to all of us, and that is opioids. And we'll start off with the most basic question, that is, what is an opioid? Well, thanks, Tom. It's my pleasure to be here. An opioid is an agent that acts on the receptors that we have in our own bodies normally that morphine binds to. We generate compounds in our own brains and nervous system that also bind to those same sites and receptors on cells. If you take an outside agent like a drug or a pharmaceutical and it also binds on those sites, then that drug or pharmaceutical is called an opioid. What is the issue with opioids that we hear so much about today? The primary issue is that in parallel with increased prescribing of opioids generally throughout all of medicine during the last 15 years or so, there has also been a parallel diversion and misuse such that there are unprecedented levels of addiction and death from opioids. In, they're not always due to an opioid alone in every case. There are many factors. It sometimes is hard to untangle these, but the overwhelming statistic is the rise of death rates attributable, at least in part, to opioids. And many of these were prescribed during a period of liberalization of opioid use amongst medicine. What should I be afraid of if I'm prescribed an opioid, and how will I know if I am prescribed an opioid? Thank you again for having me. Um, the best way to to address this is really to, to speak with your provider, your physician, when they are writing the prescription for you, um, to get a general sense of you know, what they think the course, the best course of therapy is, how long they think that you'll be taking that particular medication, how you should be taking it, what you should do if your pain is not relieved by uh, the medication that they prescribed in the way that they prescribed it. Uh, these are also conversations that you can certainly have with your pharmacist as well, uh, particularly because um, typically there's a lot of information that, that gets uh, shared with you at your doctor's appointment. You might feel stressed or 
um, worried and you may not get all of the information that you need at that particular appointment or you may not remember it. So getting that refresher and that reminder at the pharmacy counter when you pick up the medication is also a, a good idea. How will I know if I am in fact being prescribed an opioid? It will not actually tell you that it is an opioid prescription. Um, that is a question that you will either have to ask the pharmacist or your prescriber when you when you get the prescription. Um, usually if, uh, you know, when I'm counseling patients, that's one of the first things that we'll talk about is, you know, this particular medication. Uh, you know, I don't think we went over what uh, the different opioids are. So things like oxycodone, morphine, um, fentanyl, um, hydromorphone, things of, of that nature are opioid pain medications that are used specifically to treat uh, pain. What is the risk? Is it worth the risk for me to take an opioid uh, medication to treat pain at this point? Well, I'd like to answer the question by saying when we ask does something work, is it good, is it bad, what's the risk, we really need to step back and say for which patient, under which circumstance, and under whose care. So for many years, for hundreds of years, people have used morphine for acute pain, and that's been carried over into acute pain that is in the days or weeks after an operation. There are also people who have chronic pain, and that's described, often dis defined as uh, lasting three months or longer. The risks and benefits differ in each circumstance. So I would say that although there are many other agents that are available and can be used for acute pain, like after an operation, there still remains a role for opioids acutely in the hospital for serious illness and severe pain. Over the long term, for chronic use, many medicines that are given both after an operation acutely, but also chronically, have a different risk to benefit ratio if they're given chronically. And there's been a number of concerns raised ranging from uh, abuse, uh, diversion, or side effects of opioids in the long term. So I'd say the question of are opioids useful depends on who you are, who's treating you, and what you're being treated for. I've heard cases of friends and family of people who have uh, been injured and their doctors have tried several courses of treatment, none of which were very effective, and there seems to be reluctance by the doctors to prescribe opioids. So I think that the reluctance tends to, to relate back to the potential for risk and harm, and it really depends on the particular individual, the patient, and whether or not the physician or other prescriber feels that it's in their best interest to prescribe it. And there have been a number of opioid overdose deaths that uh, Dr. Carr alluded to earlier. Um, just in 2015 in the United States, there were 50,000 people who overdosed on opioids unintentionally, and in 2016, there were 64,000. Um, now, the vast majority of those are coming from um, the street fentanyl and heroin, um, but the concern is that there are some patients who may run into trouble with opioids, um, and if that occurs, then there are, there are uh, significant consequences. What advice would you give to a patient who is nervous, perhaps, that the doctor thinks they may just be seeking drugs um, instead of looking for a legitimate way to ease their pain? Well, Tom, I'd say a lot of the practice of medicine consists of recognizing that there is an alignment of motives between patient and doctor. And for many years, uh, the medical community has looked for alternatives to opioids and follows a, a dictum of least uh, effective dose for shortest possible time. So I, th I would say the fundamental assumption is not to say that the physician and patient are adversaries, but that they are aligned. And I truly believe this holds true for the vast majority of medical encounters. So if the patient knows a little bit more about the context in which opioids are given, I think that will contribute to closing the gap between attitudes and beliefs and expectations of the patient and those of the medical provider. So the things that a patient can talk about with their provider include non-drug measures that are behavioral measures, physical measures, ICE or TENS unit, drug measures that are not an opioid, let's say of the aspirin or non-steroidal family. So there's a whole gamut of things, and I go back to my first part of this by saying the views of the patient and the provider should be aligned once the context is clear. 
Thanks, Dan, for that great perspective. So the important factor there is to have candid and, and open conversation with your physician. That's correct. And that leads to another very important thing that much research, including some done in Boston, has identified that if a person has behavioral issues to begin with, they're at greater risk frequently for getting uh, inadequate pain relief and escalating their dose of opioids post-operatively or during chronic treatment. A patient who has prescribed opioids, how long will that patient be on the course of opioids and what can they expect that opioid to do for them in terms of relieving pain? So I really think that that depends on what the underlying cause of the pain is. That's also a frank conversation that they should have with their provider. Um, how long do you expect, you know, if, if I've had a surgery, what's the recovery time? How long should I expect to be taking this? If, you know, we start with maybe one to two oxycodone 5 tablets every four to six hours, and I find that I need the maximum amount for the first week, and the provider tells me that, um, you know, you should start to be feeling better after, you know, five to seven days, and at the end of that time course, I'm still using the maximum amount or I'm still finding that my pain is not adequately controlled, then that's time to, to check back in with the prescriber. Along those lines, is there a way that a patient can reduce his or her risk of addiction? If you consider that addiction represents a disease that takes over a person's motivation in life, the patient or their family may call to the attention of the provider that they're not comfortable with what's been happening. The, the desired course of recovery, let's say after an operation or, or trauma, let's say cracking of ribs, fall off a ladder, the desired course is greater and greater function and fewer and lesser doses of medication. And if you go in the other direction of no decrease in dosage across time or an increase in dosage over time, and no augmentation of function, but rather a decrease in function and a focus on getting more pain-killing medication, these should raise red flags among the patient and the family that this is not going in the right direction. So what can be done? Uh, well, as, as Karen was alluding to, first is you can deliver methods of pain treatment that are non-drug. These include behavioral treatments. If a person's anxious, for instance, addressing their anxiety can reduce their need for pain medications. Uh, you can use other types of medications than opioids, like anti-inflammatory drugs or, or other drugs that pain specialists are accustomed to treating. So you can also gauge in advance the risk. There are several very easily administered, very quick checklists that a provider can use to assess the risk based on the score in that questionnaire of giving an opioid, and that should be another factor to modify or make one more or less cautious about starting an opioid in one particular person. What are ways in which I can prevent somebody else from getting a hold of my prescription and ingesting that prescription? You know, I'm very glad that you, you brought this up because this is something that is vitally important for the, the public to know about. Um, one of the things that the National Institute on Drug Abuse has, has shown time and again in their surveying of people that have admitted to um, abusing or misusing prescription opioids, uh, the prescription opioids that they get are not prescribed to them. They tend to come from 74% of, of people uh, tend to get those pills um, from friends or family members. So it is incredibly important that if you do have an opioid pain medication that is prescribed to you, that you keep track of it that you don't leave it lying around, that you um, ensure that it is stored safely, that other people do not have access to it. Um, there are lock boxes that can be purchased at your local pharmacy if that is something that you feel is necessary. Um, and those lock boxes should also be sort of hidden away so that people don't, don't look for them. If you find that you no longer need your opioid pain medication, your, your, your pain has been treated, you're no longer in acute need, um, and you have pills left over, there are several ways in which you can get rid of those. Um, twice a year, the DEA holds take-back events throughout various cities throughout the state. You can go to the DEA website to find those locations and the specific dates. 
Most police stations across the state also have drug take back kiosks where 24 hours a day you can go in and just drop them off. Uh, many pharmacies are also following suit now where there will be drug kiosk, take back kiosks in the pharmacy. So that would be a good thing to, to call your local pharmacy and see if that is in fact something they have. Um, and the pharmacies that don't may also have mail back envelopes where you can uh, package up your medication that you're no longer using and ship it off to be destroyed. Sure. Uh, is there a way in which I could get just a part of my prescription filled. Let's say I, I don't feel that I'm going to need the entirety of the prescription. I want to reduce the risk of, of myself using more than I need to or somebody else. Absolutely, and that is your right as a patient. So if you were to come in and say um, the prescription was written for, I don't know, maybe 30 tablets and you feel that 15 is adequate for you, you can ask the pharmacist uh, to fill it for the 15. Uh, the only caveat to that is you should know the remaining 15 are no longer available to you. So if you do, in fact, need to get more, you would need to get a new prescription. What if, what if I am in the, uh, the midst of my uh, course of medication and the opioids prescribed to me just aren't working? What should I do at that point? I think that with regard to any adverse event or failure to achieve the desired outcome, you should contact your health care provider. Because uh, it, it, let's say you've been prescribed an opioid after a surgical procedure. It might be that uh, the prosthesis may be loosening. It might be that there's infection. So sometimes a worsening of pain represents a problem with the underlying condition. Or you may have uh, been treated for chronic pain, let's say from uh, uh, muscle spasm in your back, and you may herniate a disc. You may still have back pain. You may not differentiate the new cause from the old cause, but something new is happening. So I would view an ineffective prescription as potentially indicating that there's a problem that's underlying the situation and it should be looked into. So a change in the pattern of pain to me includes a change in the response to an opioid and that should be directed to the attention of the health care provider. Great. Thank you, Dan. Karen, is there a, a prescription available to me that's an opioid yet is, is non-addictive? Is that an option? Uh, unfortunately, currently there is not. Over the years, people have wondered that if you look at the diverse spectrum of actions of opioids, could you tweak the opioid molecule so that it has one action but not the second action? So these two actions might be pain relief or addiction or constipation. There have actually been molecules that have been synthesized right now in 2018 and the last couple of years that look like they can selectively cause one arm of the cascade to be activated, namely pain relief, without activating the other arms of the cascade that include addiction, constipation. These are still under trial. If I go to pick up a prescription for an opioid, uh, there are occasions on which I'll also be given a second medication called naloxone. Could you explain to me what that is and, and why that would be? Sure, so naloxone is typically used or co-prescribed with opioids that tend to be a higher dose or if patients are also taking um, other medications that could potentially interact with the opioids, so things like benzodiazepines specifically. And the medication essentially acts as a rescue medication that if a patient were to be going into an overdose situation, uh, a standard by, a family member, a friend would be able to administer that medication uh, and revive the individual. Um, it essentially knocks the opioid off of the receptors um, and provides a chance for uh, emergency medical personnel to, to come in. That's critically important to know. Uh, what, if, what if I do not have, uh, what if naloxone is not given to me at the time I pick up a prescription? Is there a way I can get it anyway just to be safe Absolutely. around these drugs? Absolutely. So in Massachusetts, we have what's called a standing order. Uh, whereby anyone who is interested in picking up a naloxone rescue kit can go into a pharmacy and just ask for it. Um, you could go to the pharmacist and say, look, I'm, I'm interested in, in a naloxone kit, and they would be able to bill it to your insurance and provide it to you right then and there. Great, Great to know and crucially important. Dan, how do I know if somebody is overdosing on an opioid? The cardinal sign of opioid overdosage is that our drive to breathe gets reduced and numbed 
And so the person may be breathing very, very slowly or not breathing at all. And as their breathing gets more and more compromised, their color will become pale or even bluish. And people don't tolerate that lack of breathing, hence lack of oxygen, for very long. And they will rapidly die unless their respirations are, uh, are revived. Uh, that's, a, that's a great point. And, uh, but one that can be quite daunting, I would, I would assume, for somebody like myself who has no medical training. Karen, how would I administer naloxone if I have no idea uh, what I'm doing in an emergency situation? How is it actually administered? So there are actually several different types of naloxone that's available. I actually have one to show you, um, but there are also, uh, there's an auto injector that acts like an AED device and walks you through the administration process. There's also a different lethal device that does not need to be put together and is just one spray and one nostril. Um, this particular uh, naloxone kit would be two of these boxes uh, and two nasal adapters. Inside of this box is this little tube and the medication itself. So you would um, first identify that the person is in fact in overdose by doing a sternal rub and ensuring that they are not uh, responsive. Uh, then you would um, provide two rescue breaths uh, because if they are in respiratory distress, that oxygen will help. Um, you're gonna put the adapter together. Uh, so you're gonna remove the yellow caps there's a, syringe, a needle in here. You're gonna remove this purple cap and you're gonna twist the, the vial of medication into the tube. Uh, then you're going to take the nasal adapter and you're going to twist it on the opposite end. And you are going to plug uh, the nostril that, the, that you're not gonna insert the nasal adapter into uh, and you're going to depress the vial, which is gonna be here like this, halfway into this nostril and then you're going to do the same thing in the other nostril. If you have not gotten a response within two minutes, um, you should repeat the dose in the other side. And in between the doses, it is vitally important that you call 911 again because depending upon what opioid is in the patient's system, uh, this medication only has a short duration of action. So if it's not, uh, if you don't get EMS uh, there, then the person can relapse and go back into overdose. Thank you, Karen, for the demonstration. I think that's it's vitally important and equally as important as remembering to call 911. Now, if I walk into a pharmacy, uh, will there be anybody there to counsel me or take me through the, a similar demonstration, a step-by-step -step on how to administer this? Pharmacists have been trained on how to administer this and the other formulations of naloxone. Um, in addition to that, in addition to this kit, you will also have a, a sort of a diagram step-by-step -step outlining signs of overdose, um, how to identify when someone is in overdose and to do the sternal rub to, to see if they are, in fact, um, arousable. Is there any other way to manage pain beside uh, taking an op opioid? Uh, what are some other courses of action that a patient may take? Over the years, there have been a number of alternatives or at least complementary therapies that have been introduced. Uh, first, uh, one has to ask, is a drug needed at all? Because, for example, for low back strain, physical therapy may be completely effective, very well tolerated, and help rehabilitate the person and need not rely on a drug. As far as medications, there are a number of medications, starting with non-steroidals, that can reduce the need for an opioid. That raises an important point, though. So many people today are on multiple medications that I think everybody who is being considered to be treated with an opioid should have their medication list evaluated for potentially adverse interaction. What do I need to know to be as safe as I can possibly be before I ingest that first pill? So first and foremost, you need to make sure that you understand the directions and how you're supposed to use it. So if it says take one tablet, you're only to take one tablet. If you feel like your pain is not being adequately treated, it's important that you contact your prescriber. Um, as Dr. Carr alluded to, uh, you definitely do not want to mix these opioid medications with alcohol because it can increase your risk of overdose. Uh, you also want to be sure that if you're taking any other prescription medications that your pharmacist is aware and that your prescribers are also aware to make sure that those medications do not interfere with one another. What if a person is in recovery 
uh, for addiction. Is that something they should make their doctor aware of when opioids are being prescribed? Tom, that's a great question. If a person is in recovery, they should definitely call this to the attention of their provider for a number of reasons. The first reason is that it is possible exposure to an opioid can trigger another episode of abuse and addiction. So you'd want to make every effort to use non-opioid and even non-drug therapies in that individual. The next reason is that drugs, including alcohol, that are an everyday drug that we have access to, taken at the same time as an opioid, dramatically increase the risk of death from stopping breathing. So this is a very important consideration. And nowadays, the standard of care for opioids used chronically involves a urine drug test to see what other substances may be there. And that may result in a reevaluation of the whole therapeutic relationship. So if a person has a history of substance abuse, it's very important to call that to the provider's attention. Um, Karen, Dan, it's been a pleasure discussing this with you, uh, some, some important information on a topic that's crucial for everybody. And uh, thank you for your expertise and for sharing some time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Likewise, thank you, Tom. Great. In my own practice, like all doctors, I try to help my patients manage their pain safely and effectively. I also work with my patients to manage their stress and trauma. That's another way to reduce their risk of becoming addicted to substances. If you're living with chronic pain, it's natural to feel isolated, maybe depressed, or wonder if others are judging you. Your pain matters. It's important to push through those feelings and ask your doctor for what you need. We need to take pain seriously and we need to treat it carefully and safely. Remember these key tips for treating pain safely. Anytime you need a pain medication for any reason, ask your prescriber if it's an opioid. Ask how long you can expect to be taking it and what you should expect it to do for you. Take the lowest possible dose for the shortest possible time. Keep your medicines private and secure. Don't share them with anyone, no matter what and get rid of any leftovers. Keep Narcan or Naloxone on hand in case of an accidental opioid overdose. Thank you to Dr. Dan Carr and Dr. Karen Horvowitz for answering our questions. I'm Dr. Mike Guidi on behalf of the Massachusetts Medical Society. Thank you for tuning in to Physician Focus. Did you know there are other ways to reduce your pain besides taking medications? For example, mindfulness. I'm Dr. Mike Guidi, family medicine doctor based in Essex County. I use mindfulness techniques with my own patients during office visits, and I'm here to tell you how you can prevent addiction. It is a way to train your brain to manage pain. Reducing your pain through mindfulness could mean you need less medication or a safer type of medication. It can also help you reduce your stress and recover from past trauma. That means you become less likely to develop an addiction, whether opioids, alcohol, or any other substance. In brain research, we scan people's brains before they start practicing mindfulness and after they've been practicing it daily for eight weeks. We see actual changes in the way their brains are wired. We see those people drawing more on their judgment and reasoning skills, resulting in safer behaviors. Massachusetts has great resources about effective mindfulness techniques. To find out more, go to massmed.org. I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines, and when taken under a doctor's supervision, provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society.